Hello and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Historical Humans podcast. My name is Justin Woods and I'm joined today by my fellow co-hosts, Colm Coleman and Aaron Gilpin. And today we are traveling to the Sinai Peninsula in a country that is now Egypt. But we're going to be talking about, oh, uh, what's their name again? I always forget yeah. about them. We we are speaking on uh, one of the more overlooked uh, peoples of history, the Nabataeans. Oh right, that's their yes. name. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Like history, uh, I have also forgotten about them. Yes. So the Nabataeans, uh, they are uh, they are a very fun subject here uh, for us to talk about because um, uh, two reasons. Number one, we don't really get to talk about like some of what would be considered the minor players of history too much on this podcast. Usually it's heavy hitters, uh, like the British, boo. and the British, and then the Spanish, and then back to the British. Yay, boo! Uh, um, and we uh, try the, to avoid that. And the other reason why it is so fun that we get to uh, talk about the Nabataeans this year with you is because they actually get to tie back into one of our other podcasts uh, from earlier this year, uh, the Seleucid podcast we did. Um, just a few short months ago. Is that um, a callback? Oh my god! That is a callback. It is. It is. It is actually baked into our schedule here with the Seleucids and the Nabataeans being in the same season. Because uh, as you will get to see, uh, the Nabataeans really do get to uh, enter their golden age because the Seleucids trip over themselves trying to figure out how to empire. <laughs> <laughs> happens to That's us fair. all. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah. I mean, they did. They really inherited something special. Yeah. Yeah. The Seleucids have a history of falling upwards and then realizing that's not how gravity works and promptly falling downwards. <laughs> this will help the Nabataeans, as we will see in a few moments. <laughs> but uh, but first, uh, I'm just very excited to get to you. Uh, what is Nabataea? Because the Nab Nabataea is um, one of those things that doesn't fit nicely on a map. A lot of times when you talk about these things, it's like, you know, what is now Syria or what is now Iran or the United Kingdom? You know, when we talk about these ancient peoples. We Nabatea, like the hard borders on the maps. Yeah. Nabataea does not respect any border of any modern nation state whatsoever. They take a little bit of everyone. They take the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt... They take the southern half of Israel. They take most of Jordan. They take, like, the southernmost edge of Syria. And then they go and they just take over northeastern Saudi Arabia. Just, this is their land. Uh, they're just a little bit of everybody. And, you know, they kind of don't differentiate between the parts. Except for Where some of Syria. Because they do, do sell that off. Name? Like, do we, do we even have, like, origins for their name? Or is it, like, an outsider name uh, for them? I believe an it is exonym. an exonym. I believe yeah, it that's is it. Ex I believe it is an exonym. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of its nomenclature. Uh, the first mention of them uh, historically is during uh, one of the wars between... Uh, I believe Macedonia and Egypt, following the death of Alexander the Great. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, that's the first time they really crop up. Uh, despite living right on the edge of uh, the Persian Empire and kind of being right where like Alexander's army would have had to march through to take Egypt and uh, the Levant and all those wonderful little mediterranean assets that the persian empire had they really don't come up in in the specific histories of alexander the great they get uh, mentioned later me? when his successors start killing each other and they get involved in the free-for-all <laughs> are you telling me that most of these people just assumed they were taking that like that little passageway was theirs and these people are just gonna like like what do you mean this is yours yeah are it's, you kidding it's, me? it's yeah, it's one of those things like they get into the Caucasus Mountains and uh, Alexander's historians start writing about how, you know, the Persians claim to rule this land, but even they could not fully subjugate them. But our Lord Alexander the Great did, in fact, do so. 
Yeah. It's like that, except the Nabataeans don't bother fighting anyone because it's like, what the hell do we care what you think you own? Right, because they're just like, we're just here, though. Yeah. Yeah, they're just here. Uh, fighting the Nabataeans, as we'll get to see later, is a death sentence uh, for all the wrong reasons. The Nabataeans are not warriors, yet they will kill you. <laughs> Uh, just it, it's just uniquely horrible trying to fight the Nabataeans. But uh, yeah, with that, with the history of the Nabataeans, we're gonna actually do something fun here. Uh, for those of you on the channel, something new, uh, which we always do like to try out. So be sure to leave comments and stuff, letting us know whether or not you think this is a more interesting way to present the history. Uh, we're gonna pre present two separate histories of the Nabataeans. The first is the history you will get 90% of the time, uh, which is the traditional Western history, which is just basically whenever the Nabataeans show up in somebody else's war. Mm -hmm. So what then, you're saying is there's a real history and a fake history. <laughs> there's this very basic history that is just whenever it's convenient for others to mention the Nabataeans. And then, then the there's a much, they don't want you to know. Then there's a much deeper history that is still not fully... Uh, written of, not fully uh, excavated in archaeological sense, that's still got a lot of mystery shrouded on it, but is a much fuller picture of how these people came to be from nomadic Arab tribes. Uh, and I say that in terms of what would be eth what would become ethnically Arab. Uh, and into the Nabataeans, and then into their... Uh, decline and then resurgence because uh, they do a lot of really weird stuff uh, from just a summary perspective in order to stay alive and it's all actually pretty intelligent from their from their part these people lived by being smart and that uh, yeah now as we're going to see that unfortunately means you get forgotten by history once history passes you over but uh Ooh, yeah, I'm gonna take a breath here. No, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the... I mean, I would too. When you're spewing out alternate histories here, yeah, not alternate. I know. I just Richard have to histories. tease you because you're separating Richard. the histories. Richard. We have like the expedited version, the cliff notes, and then we have yeah. like the actual authentic yeah. history. Yeah, and the, yeah. And the reason we have the cliff notes here is because almost every source I went to refused to elaborate beyond the cliff notes. And it's just like, okay, so this is just what we've decided for whatever reason is the full history of these people. And it's not even their history. According to most of our sources, the history of the Nabataeans begins in 312 BCE, where they spring fully formed like Athena from the head of Zeus. Oh, boy. Understandable. Uh, they are uh, invaded by Demetrius I of Macedonia, uh, fun fact, he is not Demetrius I of Macedonia at this time. He is just a general. Uh, you're going to see a lot of names of kings on these lists uh, about invading these people in 312 because so many people become king of Macedonia uh, just back to back in this time. <laughs> but um, the Demetrius I of Macedonia invades them in 312 BCE. They are repelled during the siege of Petra, the Nabataeans win. Uh, Petra is a mountain fortress in the south of the Dead Sea, which is a body of water on the border of Israel and Jordan uh, today. Um, the Nabataeans had a monopoly on the caravan trade to the interior of the Arabian Peninsula. And this trade had made them very wealthy and had made them a lucrative target uh, as sort of a side project during a war between Macedonia and Egypt. Uh, it was seen as, this is a good target to hit, we'll invade them, plunder their riches, and, you know, use that to fund our shit. Uh, doesn't really work out. Then the Seleucid Empire goes into decline during the 2nd century BCE, which is the second time we get to see the Nabataeans mentioned. Um, they go back to apparently not existing for about 200 years. Uh, 
I, I wouldn't say that they went to non-existent because that is kind that, of a, a moot point. That, They're just not that, represented in the historical yeah. record. That, that that's how the history records treat them. Is it's just it's just they just stop being mentioned. They just nothing. It's what the hell's going on here? They go to a period of irrelevancy in terms of the historical record, which usually isn't a bad thing. Because it yeah. usually implies an era of somewhat level of peace, of stability. If you're not really having a whole lot going on, I doubt these people just quite literally vanished off the face of the earth for 200 years that, and went, but, and we're yeah. back. That that is that is how they are treated. Um, they they are treated like uh, they they are treated like someone getting spawn camped in a video game where it's just they pop up, fully formed, and then they disappear. And that's just how they get treated in the writings of so many of the sources, so much of the history. That's just how they get treated. And it's honestly a shame. Yeah, but yeah, we're yeah. also kind of leaning into that here, which is why I'm kind of making a point to... Yeah, well, that's because we're going to go into, we're going to go into like what actually is going on a little bit later, just to set up just how many gaps there are before we go into okay. what's more known. That's that's what we're doing. That's, that's, the, that's the format we're going for today. Um... And this time, uh, they actually get to have a king. Uh, we actually get to know the name of their leader. Oh. Uh, his name is King Aritas III. Uh, Aritas III is expansionistic. He pushes the empire of the Nabataeans northward and eastward into what was the Seleucid Empire. Um, and by 85 BCE, by the by the early uh, first century here, he has taken the Haran region of Syria, he has taken Lebanon, and he has taken the city of Damascus, mm. which is a big prize because the Seleucids, as uh, we elaborate on in our Seleucid video, they fight over Damascus a lot. Being king of Damascus is a big deal for them. So for someone else to be ruling it is kind of, you know, kind of the end. Yeah. Um, Aritas III also makes the Nabataeans Roman vassals in 63 BCE. Uh, 63 is the year Pompey Magnus invades Palestine in the name of Rome. And Aritas kind of reads the writing on the wall and sees that these, these Italian people are... Uh, They've built a bigger empire than any of the ones the Nabataeans have been dancing around uh, for the past few hundred years. And so he signs on for like with a friendship pact with the Romans. Um, and this vassalship allows the Nabataeans to keep their new conquests, which they got at the expense of Rome's enemies, and more or less continue to exist as a nice little comfy buffer state between the Romans and the Arabian Peninsula. <laughs> Um, then we see them again with, uh, the rule of Emperor Nero a hundred years later, uh, Nero rules from 54 to 68 CE. Nero decides that these Nabataeans have things too good. So he annexes the city of Damascus. Uh, the Nabataeans can't really do much to complain about that. They do have generally have a peaceful and prosperous time as Roman vassals uh, for the uh, about 150 years that they do. Uh, however, the history of the Nabataeans then formally comes to an end, uh, air quotes there, with uh, the reign of Emperor Trajan. Uh, Trajan rules Rome from 98 to 117 CE, and between the years 105 and 106 CE, he formally annexes Nabatea to form the Roman province of Arabia, uh, wherein he fully uh, removes the Nabataeans from power by shifting the capital from the Nabataean capital of Petra, their fortress city, to the city of Bostra, modern-day Basra. Uh, and that is what is typically seen as the conclusion of the Nabataeans. They are now... Uh, they are now the Arabians, and they are a Roman vassal, or a Roman province, not even a vassal. Oh, yeah. 
and that's generally written as and that's all she wrote for them uh, and they're just kind of seen as not there then yeah yeah and that's the sad truth of almost the entirety of their history aside from like signing the deal with Pompey Magnus and fighting in that one war between Macedonia and Egypt they're regarded by history books by their neighbors as a non-entity which the Nabataeans in their time found useful but in terms of the uh, in terms of the written history is a very mu- is a very real shame because these people do deserve uh, a lot more recognition than they're getting mm. like these people are very clever uh which we do get to see in the fuller story of the Nabataeans, which uh, which is a much broader history, but it's still riddled with holes. Um, the politi- be- because all the uh, a lot all the written sources for the Nabataeans come from outside contact. No one really knows when the like Nabataean identity formally established itself, uh, or you know. Who the Nabataeans, uh, shall we say, uh, cultural ancestor is? There's a couple of claimants that get very interesting, get very biblical, get very weird. <laughs> um, we don't really go into that too much. Uh, we do try to stick to uh, more of the uh, historians in this, just because um, there would be some very serious uh, theological implications of some of this stuff. And I don't really want to step into that, into that bog. Yeah, no, that's fair. That can get dicey. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to drown into that bog of people claiming themselves to be, you know, the true sons of the second coming or some other such stuff. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, with the, with the more full story of the Nabataeans, uh, we get to acknowledge the Nabataeans existing as far back as the 5th and 6th centuries BCE uh, with some speculative contact uh, by none other than the Greek historian, the father of history himself, Herodotus. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, getting, Herodotus. Getting some uh, proper. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Herodotus, for viewers who may not know, uh, he is considered the person to have written the first ever history book. He is considered to have founded the discipline of history in uh, Greek and therefore later Western culture. Uh, So literally in the first history book ever written, we have potential references to the Nabataeans. Um, There's a possible account in the histories of Herodotus uh, during his recording of the 6th century history of Persia. And the story goes in in the histories that Cambyses, king of Persia, makes an alliance in 525 uh, BCE uh, for his invasion of Egypt. He makes an alliance with an unnamed, unknown people who were in the area of northern, uh, you know, northeastern. Uh, Saudi Arabia slash Jordan uh, was their territory. They were the right area to be the Nabataeans. And they agreed to basically supply the Persian army for the duration of the campaign in return for their independence being acknowledged by the Persians. This is the same deal that later Nabataean kings make over and over again. Most famously, Aretas III, and uh, the Romans with his vassal vassalship agreements. So we see people in the area of Nabatea behaving like the Nabataeans do. Oh, you've got a big army and want to come through our land? How about we fund that army and you agree not to conquer us? <laughs> this is uh, this is their general foreign policy uh, throughout all of Nabatean history, and so that kind of lends credence to the fact that the Nabataeans are in some form existing here as far back as 525, which is a lot earlier than the uh, other record that usually gets put forth of them first existing in 312. Like, you know, an extra 200 years of history goes into this. 
Uh, by the fourth century uh, BCE, the Nabataeans have become a distinct uh, political entity with international contacts, international trade, a recognizable cultural identity. Um, they get recorded by Diodorus, who is a personal historian of Alexander the Great. Uh, he gets re he records them uh, during the attempted invasion of the Nabataeans in 312 BCE uh, by Macedonia later on. So he gets they get recorded uh, post Alexander the Great by this man. Um, and the uh, reason why we're bringing up his name now is because so much of what Diodorus writes about the Nabataeans gets left out of the history of the Nabataeans. Uh, for whatever reason, people like rush to summarize the invasion and they kind of ignore all the stuff that this very famous historian writes about them, specifically their culture and tactics, which really speaks to um, desert warfare. Like these people did guerrilla warfare to a T. Uh, like I I'm talking like put Rommel to shame kind of desert warfare. Yikes. Um. Yeah, they are they are scary. Yeah. Yeah. So the record the recorded history is that Antigonus the First of Macedon, also not ruling uh, at this time, uh decides to invade Egypt. However, in order to do so, he needs to send Demetrius the First of Macedon, also not ruling at this time, to invade the Nabataeans to prevent the Nabataeans from supplying the Egyptian army because apparently by 312, the Nabataeans had made the same agreement they had with Persia with the Egyptians <laughs> of we fund your army, you leave us alone. <laughs> and uh, so Demetrius I is sent to invade Nabataea so that Antigonus I can lead his campaign against Egypt un, uh, unharassed. Uh, the Nabataeans are believed to be Egyptian allies at this time, and there's also just the general possibility that the Nabataeans were in the way and wouldn't take kindly to an invading army marching through their land to attack their, like, number one trade partner. Yeah, that would be... Yeah. Uh, that would be unideal, especially for the economy, of course. Yeah. Of course, yeah. about the economy, guys. Now, Diodorus, uh, like Herodotus, does not record the name of the Nabataean leadership. Um, and it is entirely possible there was not centralized leadership uh, in the sense that we would think of today with, like, kings. More of a centralized, like, cultural identity of just, we're all the people that live here. We all speak this language. We all live this way of life. Yeah. Um, uh, the... Recordings of Diodorus indicate that these are a pastoral people with a strong sense of independence and intimate knowledge of an inhospitable desert who trade in Arabian luxuries. Um, he records that the Nabataeans could literally grow uh, reservoirs and aquifers out of the desert, bury those aquifers, wait for you to invade them, then take all their cattle, run into the desert, and just live off of the water they had stored there over, like, the past 50 years, and you would never catch or find them. So it wasn't even worth the time. No, it's not worth the time to chase them. And even if you did chase them, eventually they would all just coalesce at the city of Petra, which is itself a giant rock fortress in the center of an inhospitable desert that has, in addition to being a massive sheer cliff face in a valley, been reinforced by humans. And they would just wait up there, let the sun bake you, and throw rocks at your head. <laughs> Till you either died in the desert or went away. <laughs> I mean, it's effective. Yeah. It's they, they literally kill you by not touching you. They refuse to fight you and you just die. <laughs> you just kind of stand there and be like, dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like just people walking by are just like, yeah. Yeah. 
and then just like meanwhile they're just they're just literally it's it's literally just sitting on a sand dune cranking out a cold one with the boys watching all these idiots march over like six different sources of water only to die of dehydration because only the Nabataeans know the water is there because they buried the water there. I mean, that's a pretty common thing, though, that you see with uh, defenders in terms of invasions. It's just a general overall increased knowledge of the local area. They're able to know where resources are, and they're able to survive off the land a lot more. So what yeah, adds what an extra are. layer of challenge to invading armies. Yeah. And one of the fun things with the Nabataeans, why they uh, excel at this, is because it's not just knowledge of the local land that they're using to survive with their guerrilla tactics. They are manufacturing uh, natural resources. They are manufacturing hidden aquifers, hidden reservoirs, all these extra sources of water they are building up in times of peace and then burying also in times of peace so that no one but they know it's there and no one but they can use it. And it's just one of those things where it's just like, you know, it's not just I know where the oasis is. I don't need the oasis. I've hidden six more oases somewhere in this sand. Good luck. And some of them have spikes. Yeah. It's just, it's just that extra level of going out of the way to add resources that only they would be able to use. I mean, it's a good, it's a good way. I mean, it... <laughs> you'd love to see it, though. Yeah. And the 312 BC invasion culminates in the failed siege of Petra, and the Nabataeans repulse the Macedonians. Um, in what follows during the 3rd and 2nd century, the Nabataeans become sedentary and begin expanding their territories. They are no longer pastoral and semi-nomadic. Um, they continue their uh, domination of what is known as the incense route, which is a trade in luxuries from Yemen and Saudi Arabia with places like Egypt, Israel, uh, the Romans, all the rest of that into the Mediterranean. Uh, that is, you know, it gets its, you know, gets its name because incense, you know, was the like number one uh, selling product that came out of this region. Uh, because, you know, let's be honest. Air freshener in a time when toilets don't exist is worth so much money. All You're right. not wrong. Can you imagine what you would get selling a bottle of Febreze? Dude, I've already had to go into like the porta potties at a music festival in the, mu in the middle of summer. I imagine yeah. it'd probably be somewhere akin to that without air fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Not pleasant. Not pleasant. No, it's just it's just one of those things that just like just go back in time, sell one can of Febreze, become Mansa Musa. <laughs> I mean, I it's wouldn't mind simple. being Mansa Profit. Musa. Yeah. He's pretty wealthy. Yeah. The uh the Nabataeans will rule their increasingly sedentary territory from the city of Petra in what is now Jordan. Now, Petra, as we mentioned before, is a uniquely fortified position. It is built on a terrace that is pierced from east to west by the Wadi Musa, which is known as the Valley of Moses, and is supposedly where Moses struck rock and water gushed forth, i.e., there's a reservoir in these cliffs. <laughs> um, the entire city is enclosed by sandstone cliffs, which are known for red, purple, and yellow colors. They're very bright. They're very striking. A lot of the carved rock uh, in uh, the city of Petra has since become UNESCO World Heritage Sites and major tourist attractions for just how beautiful the stone-carved buildings in the area are. The uh, population of Petra is between 10,000 and 30,000 people at its height. So it's a decent, it's, it's a decently sized fortress town. It's not uh, a metropolis like uh, other, um, other big imperial capitals that we talk about, like Rome or Damascus or... Um, you know, Alexandria. It you know, it's not a metropolis. This is a desert fortress 
for a desert people. Uh, it sustains what it would be a very large population for them, but, you know, it's nothing compared to the major empires, and it just speaks to the way of life they have persisting. They remain desert. I mean... It's just the ingenuity to create, like, just to, and the ability to endure. I, I, I like it. It makes for a great story, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one of the fun things about Petra, uh, that will, uh, get into the reasons why these are here later on with, uh, the history of the Nabataeans is, um, it is home to two very famous, uh, sites that are, very unique blendings of Roman architecture with um, with how the Nabataeans like to build and with uh, some Greek stuff thrown in as well. Uh, these are known as the Cosna and Aldair. They are large, abandoned uh, Roman tombs that are just carved into the side of, um, of the Cliffs of Petra. Uh, oh. One of them... Uh, actually featured in uh, the Indiana Jones franchise during the Last Crusade as the uh, final resting place for the Holy Grail. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they're in I mean, I mean, the area, you know, also with like, hey, Moses was over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, the city of Petra will become abandoned following an earthquake in 551 CE. Uh, that is when uh, that is when the city is finally abandoned by the Nabataeans. Uh, you know, a far, you know, 450-year cry from when most uh, of the historical record stops talking about the Nabataeans uh, with the annexation by Trajan in 106. Uh, this is a far cry, much longer history we see with just the city alone. And, uh, well, we're on the side tangent of the city. The Islamic invasion of the 7th century and the Crusades of the 12th century both built military outposts here because it is such a convenient fortress spot uh, for any army uh, performing an invasion. Whether you are sweeping northward into the Levant and Egypt from the Arabian Peninsula or whether you are trying to invade into the Arabian Peninsula from the Mediterranean Sea. It's just such a good position that whenever there's a major prolonged war, people just kind of set up camp here. I mean, yeah, it's, it makes sense. Yeah, it's just a fun little thing where it's like people just keep coming back. The uh, but like back to the Nabataeans in general. Aside from their capital of Damascus, they also ruled a number of, or sorry, their capital of Petra. They also ru ruled a uh, number of other major cities, including the uh, one of the Seleucid capitals, Damascus, as well as Al Arish, Gaza, Basra, Madaba, and Decapolis, which is a very Roman name for a city. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh... yeah, definitely an X in there because I believe Decapolis exists before they become Roman clients. But yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, as they expand and push into the declining Seleucid Empire, the, uh, the Nabataeans actually form a, uh, standing alliance with, uh, with Judea and, uh, 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 the, you know, and the, uh, Jewish kingdom. Uh, King Jonathan of Judea allies with the Nabataeans and seeks their aid in 160 BCE. Um, and this is, this alliance is kind of born out of, um, mutual ambition from both the Nabataean dynasties and the Hasmonean dynasty of Judea. They mirror each other in their expansion into the Seleucid Empire with Judea expanding more along the coastline and the Levant, uh, north by, uh, northeast and... Nabatea expanding along the vast deserts uh, that are further inland from that, taking just more and more of this less than desirable desert real estate that they know how to live in. 
And so the two of them kind of have this pact of just sort of growing side by side. Um, oh. You know, the the Judea, you know, Judea gets the coastline, which is what it wants, and the Nabataeans get all this arid territory that the Judeans really can't use. <laughs> both both sides win. And uh, it is also at this time that the historical recording of the kings of Nabatea begins. Uh, they record After all that time. Yep. After yep. all this, this time, that's when it starts. Yeah. This, this is when this is when we start getting it written down. Uh, this is where oh, we start getting well, yeah. written sources for it. Um, the the Nabataeans uh, record twelve kings across two hundred and seventy five years, um, with uh, a bit of a incongruency right at the beginning. Uh, uh, there are two major incongruencies. The first of which is their very first king, King Eritas the uh, first. We only know that he was ruling in one sixty nine. We have no idea when he got on the throne. We have no idea when he got off it. Um, so it's just like, here's the starting point. Yeah, that's all it, that matters. It, yeah, yeah. It's like one of those things like the Egyptian list of kings where like there's gaps in there where it's like someone had to rule between when this person was born, you know, when this person died and when this person took the throne, right? There'll be all those little gaps in there because there's just oh. records missing. Do you think it's a legacy from, or like uh, an inspiration from like the list of kings, like the Egyptian list of kings? Um, it could be. Uh, I don't believe that the list we have here is necessarily a Nabataean list, but rather a list compiled from various other minor sources, such as, uh, for example, King Jonathan of Judea's records. Oh, so this is uh, like a post-written record. Yeah, this, this, this is like a okay. post-reconstruction. Like, we finally get people writing down the names of these kings of Nabatea, because the last time uh, someone really wrote about them was Diodorus in 312, and the Nabataeans are either too decentralized to have a single king, or Diodorus just doesn't get to know enough about them to find out who that is. Okay, yeah. Uh yeah, in addition to the mystery surrounding the exact reign of Aretas I, uh, there is then some confusion as to who rules next, because we have what appears to be joint rule between King Erotimus, who rules from 110 to 100 BCE, and King Aretas II, who rules from 110 to 96 BCE. Um, that is when the line of these kings picks up again. And from here on out, it should be uh, consistent uh, reign, one reign to another, uh, nice and easy, much more formalized. But uh, it is interesting that we have two people claiming the throne right here <laughs> um, for a protracted period of time. Uh, it appears to be joint rule. It might just be that, like, the records are a bit fuzzy here. <laughs> yeah, that, that I mean, that tends yeah. to happen a, a lot yeah. more. Yeah. Because keep in mind, we've got this gap here where if we take it at face value and assume that there is, in fact, no actual gap, then King Eratus was ruling for a minimum of 59 years. Which, which is one which is one hell of a reign. It's not impossible, but it is one hell of a reign. Yeah, you, you really, yeah, really kind of had yeah, some good doctors, I guess. Yeah, he's, he's putting All up some about air or yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just putting up some Ramsey's the Great kind of numbers. <laughs> what do you mean how did he live for so long? He just did. Yeah. Yeah. Then after this, we get Obadus the first, uh, who for the longest time when I was writing this, I kept putting his name as Obadias. Obadias. <laughs> I it's love Obadas. There is no A. Or oh, sorry, there's no I in there. field. <laughs> Yeah. It's just one. <laughs> uh Obadas, the first rules for uh, a nice uh nine years, ninety-six to eighty-seven. Um then uh we have some misfortune striking the Nabataeans with uh, the rule of Rabel the first, who rules in eighty seven BC only. Uh he is then succeeded by uh, Aratus the third, who rules from eighty-seven to sixty-two, 
uh, Artist the Third being um, the king who really gets like the final push of expansion for the Navateans going. The king that uh, gets that deal for vassalship with the Romans, kind of like how the Navateans had with Egypt 300 years prior and with Persia 200 years before that. Uh, you know, so he, he's he's the one who carries that tradition out to its uh, to its logical conclusion. Um, then we have Obadus the second, sixty two to sixty, very short reign. Don't really get a lot there. Then we have um, uh, the period where the Nabataeans start naming themselves like Sith lords. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, what? We have the rule of King Malicus the <laughs> first. Oh, uh, thirty-year reign, sixty to thirty. Um, I believe he gets praised for the stability and prosperity of his reign by the Roman historian Strabo, uh, uh, in a posthumous sort of way. Uh, he's dead by the time I think St uh, Strabo writes about him. Still, though, yeah. Um. Then we round out the Obadas, uh, definitely not Obadias, we swear, <laughs> uh, with Obadas III ruling 30 to 9 BCE. Um, one of the interesting things you'll notice with uh, some of the Nabataean kings is that once they become Roman vassals, their reigns start marrying certain periods uh, of Roman history, like the Second Triumvirate here. <laughs> Um, more or less implying that the more or less implying that these kings may have gotten deposed, uh, following you know certain reformations and Roman civil wars. Seeing as I how, mean... as a Roman vassal, you have to pick a side. Yeah, and uh, being out here uh, on the border of Egypt and Judea, more often than not, you find yourself on the wrong side of Roman history. Yeah, it's either you you kind of have to pick a side at that point. Yeah, it's you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah. Then you have um, yeah. Then you have uh, Aritas the fourth here, rounding out our collection of the Aritas. Um. They couldn't stop at a trilogy. They had to make that fourth extra film. But wait, there's one. There's one more. Yeah, he uh, he crosses the border of the world into Christianity with his reign lasting from nine B.C.E. to forty C.E. Here, that must have um, been a weird changeover. Like, hey, yeah. why do we stop saying B.C.E. and why do we start saying A.D.? <laughs> yeah, did you not hear about this I... Jesus kid? <laughs> like, Guys, the calendar started counting up. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? Hey guys, it's the year zero. We're gonna start over here, okay? We're gonna count up from here. Listen, we didn't know exactly what was gonna happen when it reached zero, but it's a bit anticlimactic. Oh my god, it's like when the Mayan calendar clicked over, it's like, oh, it just keeps going. Yeah. 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 Uh yeah. Fun, you know. Fun fact with Aretas the Fourth and paralleling Roman history, uh, his overture comes at about the same time as the end of uh, the, shall we say, insane Roman Emperor Caligula. As the oh Roman my. Emperor Claudius will take the throne from him in the year 41. <laughs> uh, so, you know, purges anybody? <laughs> Were any of them really that crazy, though? Uh Caligula, you can make the argument for being spite more spiteful than insane. Although, having the history books declare your horse your chief advisor and your armies declare war upon the ocean itself uh, does not make for a very rational appearance. Hey, a lot of that could easily have been propaganda. <laughs> it's real funny. Or just though. insults. <laughs> that too. Yeah. Tell me it isn't funny, though. Caligula is still like fucking himself. hilarious. <laughs> uh. Um, that takes us to the reign of Malicus II, because, of course, we have to have a second Sith Lord. Always two there are, no more, no less. <laughs> uh, 
Malicus goes from 40 to 70, um, which means that he does make it out of the year of the four emperors <laughs> into the rule of Vespasian, which uh, is very impressive. And then he snuffs it. <laughs> ah, you know, he, he made it. That's what counts. Do you hate to yeah. see it? Yeah. And then finally, we have the reign of Rabbel II, who rules from 71 Rabble? to. Yep. Yep. Rabble. Yep. They have oh, wow. some very fun names with the Nabataeans here. <laughs> Maybe they're yeah. just like the the names are just kind of like recorded as like what was like going on. The guy yeah. was actually just like hearing a bunch of noise outside from like a party, and he's just like, yeah. "God, this fucking rabble!" And then yeah. just instinctively writes it down. Yeah. Oh yeah. One one of the one of the fun things with um with the uh, um was it the uh, Nabataean kings here? is unlike the other Roman vassals, once they get vassalized, um, their kings don't get epithets that say lover of Rome or friend of the Romans. Their kings get start all start appearing with epithets such as lover of his people, defender of the sand. <laughs> you know, they Wait, all start getting this... name they all start getting epi they all start getting titles like that, implying that they remain fiercely anti-Roman despite being a Roman vassal. You know what it kind of reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of Black Adam. Because, oh, like... A, a little bit. A yeah, little because bit he's, he's just like... Because he's like, yeah, no, I love my city. That's yeah. it! <laughs> yeah. yeah I love my people. Because yeah, their yeah. they're, they're are just like, if you call me a lover of Rome, I will start beheading everyone, and I will take this empire down with me. It, it's it, it's uh it, it's the Batman logic of you know it's like here's the Justice League to defend the world and Gotham and, and like, Gotham. Oh and no, we <laughs> did not bring Batman into it's this. Just like, it's like, I love no, Batman. We're here to defend the world. No, I'm here to defend Gotham. Gotham it is just a part stopped. of the world. Therefore, yes. I will keep the world existing so as to defend <laughs> Gotham. <laughs> if, if Gotham was on the moon, Earth, he would he have would, nothing to do with Earth. He would leave the Earth to die. Oh Gotham my god. <laughs> but Batman, we could really use your help. I'm sorry, it's Gotham under Earth. No, it's on the moon now. Batman, yeah. they're attacking DC. But is it Gotham? <laughs> yeah, it's just like... Yeah. But Gotham won't get its federal crime aid if the capital falls. I'll be right there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. One of the funny things with the uh, Rappel the second back to like the actual Nabataean kings is um he doesn't so much die like the other kings are. He just gets kicked off the throne by Trajan. Trajan just decides you're not king anymore. That's usually how it goes with a lot of client and, state kings. Yeah. And the thing is like and the thing is like there's nothing he can do about it because the Roman army just walks in from Egypt and they're just like, we live here now. And it's like, damn it. Yeah, that does that does end their kings, but it's nice that we, like, we get this nice, consistent list. And despite the fortunes of the Nabataean kings really being forced to parallel the stability of Rome... They do end up with some fairly long and prosperous reigns. Like they get let alone for so much shit. <laughs> I mean, can you blame them? Like it. They're... Why care about things that are going on next door? Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. If it doesn't partake to me, like that is, that is one oh one like logic for when you live in a not so great area i don't know what's happening down the street for me i know what's happening in my yard yeah, yeah it's like hey if it ain't my if it ain't my business i i, ain't I know nothing about nothing yeah yeah it's the uh yeah see it's, it's the uh i remember there's a silly uh thing that was like going around like tiktok or whatever with like the uh more important, like, here we have a man who actually saw the crime. He goes, no, I didn't see nothing. I don't see good at all. I'm nearly blind. In fact, I don't even see you right now here, sir. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. In fact, like, Navity is actually doing really well for itself during this time. Um, they join up with Rome as a vassal in 63 BC, like we've said. 
when Pompey Magnus, uh, a Roman general and member of the First Triumvirate, uh, decides that he has finished conquering the last of Seleucid Empire and the Kingdom of Judea. Anyone who is even remotely familiar with the history of the Romans and the Jews know that that last part is more of a bad joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen, that's not definitely. I don't think he's gonna like you know put it on an arch or anything. Yeah, no, that'd be more of a Flavian thing, you know, monumental architecture. I hear this Pompey guy is more of an amphitheater man. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, though. <Oof>. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Aretas III keeps Nabate independent through his vassalship agreements with Pompey, and they support the Roman army and their foreign policies. In return, Nabatea keeps its territories and its autonomy. It's the same deal with 6th century Persia, the same deal with 4th century Egypt. This is how the Nabateans have survived since time immemorial. If someone bigger is next door, agree to feed their army, and then leave them alone. Because <laughs> no it, empire it's not lasts. It's a bad forever. strategy. Yeah. I mean, at this point, you've outlived three iterations of the Persian Empire uh, and are about to outlive the entire kingdom of Egypt. <laughs> You're doing pretty good for yourself. <laughs> Um, one of the unfortunate things about these deals is that it means that later on, um, Obadiah III has to back the Roman invasion of Yemen in 25 BCE. Yes, the Romans invaded Yemen. Oh, this, is that's the right. least, this is one of the least talked about Roman wars because it is so stupidly failed. Why is like, it always the Romans, though? Like, why? I mean, why? they were in the area. Yeah. Now, the they reason really why... wanted that coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they wanted the incense. The Romans did not like having to pay for stuff. And Typical. as trade as trade stood, in order to buy incense and all their Febreze that they needed for all their Roman outhouses, uh, the scented candle market had to be manufactured in Yemen moved along the deserts of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, which the Nabataeans were the only ones who could navigate. Uh, then there was a tariff in Nabatea, so the Nabataeans could get their money back. And then it was sold to the Romans. And there is only so much the Romans can do by attempting to boat through the, uh, through the Red Sea and then carry shit into the Nile. <laughs> Uh, via Egypt. So they decide, why don't we just rule Yemen? We'll make the cat we'll make the candles ourselves. Fine. We don't want to pay for the candles, we'll make the candles. So you're trying to tell me that they were in denial? Yep. Yeah. They're in denial. Um they're in the Red Sea too at this point. Oh no. And oh boy, is that sea gonna turn red. Um the Nabataeans, despite not having uh, too much to do with the actual invasion itself, aside from just giving all the Romans the food and supplies like they agreed, you know, being the Roman supply chain, when this blows up in Rome's face, as you would think it would, uh, just given the fact that it's Rome, it's a remote desert uh, location, uh, it's just never good for them, uh, the Nabataeans get blamed for the Roman failure. Uh, and in order to avoid dying himself, uh, Obodos III here uh, blames his military advisor, Seleus, and has him executed. Because oh, no. basically, <laughs> our neighbor was an idiot. He threw a frisbee into someone's yard, got beat up trying to get the frisbee back, and that's now our fault. Yeah, that makes sense. That's just a new for me, bud. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Now, the process of Hellenization and Romanization in Nabatea during this time, during their vassalship, is very, very slow. The Nabataeans fiercely held on to their culture and traditions. Um, they, you know, they were very much, we are Nabataeans, 
we have our way and we will accept no other. Um, you know, it was borderline the, you know, uh, American tourist expectation of, you know, everyone should speak English when I go on vacation in Spain. Oh, oh that's more of the British. Yeah. I mean, they, really they should. The British it's, conquered half you know, the world. It's, it's, they, did know, they do technically own, um, uh, Gibraltar. Yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's one of the things. And one of the major benefits to civilization that comes out of the Nabataeans being so fiercely anti Roman, despite being Roman vassals, is the Nabataean writing system. They do develop writing, and, and uh, their script for writing uh, becomes the foundation for Arabic. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So the Nabataeans getting written out of history is like removing the Phoenicians and the Greeks from the history of, you know, from the history of how language, you know, you know, writing in the rest in the West forms, because this is the form. This is the writing that becomes Arabic. Same, same That's as really you know, cool. Yeah. So it's just like these people are foundational. <laughs> So they're not really gone. They are quite literally still. Yeah, they're still speaking their language in a way. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I think like, they're the real winners here, considering yeah, that yeah, that's the like, legacy. Yeah, it's just like if your empire is so great, how come you write in my language? <laughs> <laughs> is that why do you use my alphabet? Yep. Hey, that's a Greek word. Yeah. Yep. That's not what I said. Syllabary. Uh, so I don't think Arabic is alphabetized, so checkmate. Oh, is it? Is it not? I don't think it is. I could be wrong, but I thought they I thought they used a different system. I'm blanking on the name for it. Um I could be wrong. Um but uh, you know, that's one of the things. Let us know in the comments down below. Remember, if we don't know something immediately off the top of our heads on this podcast, you get to spam it in the comments. <laughs> yes, that is your privilege. Yeah, uh, the uh, the Nabataeans, meanwhile, keep their own architectural styles and building orders, which will get blended with the Roman stuff later on and create those beautiful, uh, unique monuments in Petra that have since become like world heritage sites and major tourist attractions out in Jordan. Um, the uh, like we mentioned before, uh, specific, you know, with Aretas the first uh, or the fourth specifically. Uh, gets the epithet he who loves his people, not he who loves Rome or the friend of the Romans, like many Roman vassals would. And that's kind of a tradition that keeps through with many of these kings getting uh, getting named for uh, how much they care about Nabatea and the people of Nabatea, rather than how much they get along with the Romans. Because <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Understandably so. Yeah. Um, the uh, historian Strabo, who is a historian in both the first century BCE and the first century CE, uh, does praise them a lot for their prosperity and their organization, um, which is a big deal for a uh, for a historian of Rome to start talking about how these tiny vassals over here are so good at government. Um, hey, that's true. Because, yeah, that's because anything that is not praising Rome is seen as insulting Rome. That is generally how the Roman court works. <laughs> um, how dare you uh, praise these Easterners? Yeah. To which, to which Strabo said, "Fuck you! I'm Greek born." <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. He he talks about how the laws are well codified. They are administered through governors and commanders. They control the wadis, which is the word for valleys, uh, with dams for water use and trade stations, all of which are very well maintained. He's impressed by their uh, effectively their irrigation system in a desert. Uh, yeah. it, 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 it astonishes him. Like, how are you getting water out here? Yes. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> it's just one of those things of just like it, it, basically the Nabataeans are the Fremen of Dune where it's just like there is water here. You just can't see it. 
Oh, that's kind of cool. Die now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just can't see it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he does talk a bunch about how they prosper from controlling the incest route, which is that route of trade goods between the Air Air Arabian Peninsula and Europe. What Strabo doesn't mention is that the Romans, uh, uh, throughout the entirety of the vassal ship, start actively undermining uh, Nabataean control of this uh, trade route. Uh, their most overt attempt is the invasion of, uh, of Yemen. However, they start doing all sorts of weird shipping things where they uh, build fleets in the Red Sea and have it sail down to Yemen, buy the goods there, sail back to Egypt, and then ship it off into the Nile and then into the Mediterranean. So they start their own elaborate trade route just so they don't have to pay, like, the Nabataeans five cents on the dollar. <laughs> so that's what that exped exped uh, expedition into Nubia was about then, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's all sorts of bullshit they do trying to get closer routes and easier access between the Nile and the, uh, and the Red Sea. Uh, they do not think of the Suez Canal. They do not think to build that. I do not think they could have. Well, you know, they probably could have. The, the Romans couldn't have built it, but the French did. So, you know, we, yeah. we see who is the real victor of history here. Which yeah. you could learn about in our, at least a little bit about in a previous episode on the Panama yeah. Canal. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing. Yeah. Another thing that comes up in this. Uh, Which the United this, States uh, trumps France when it comes to building the Panama Canal. So, in reality, they should have invented the United States to dig the canal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strabo's yeah. just like rolling at his grade like why didn't we think of this sorry we were talking all uh, different histories here I just thought I'd come up with my yeah. own yeah and finally we're going to do the last phase of uh, Nabat uh, Nabataean history because after uh, after the takeover and uh, well really after the collapse of the Roman Empire they're not Nabataeans anymore the culture has shifted enough for a new player to take their place and then effectively do the same thing the Nabataeans did for centuries, just to the Byzantines, and then the Ottomans, and just be really, really mean about it. Uh, yeah, uh, following following the Romanization, they become uh, they become militant Nabataeans, which means Nabataeans with a very angry army. Uh, Saracen horse archers, hello. <laughs> yeah. But yes, uh, the Romans take over Nabataea in 106 CE. Roman Emperor Trajan re revokes Nabataea's allied vassal status to turn it into the province of Arabia. The reason he does this is because Romans want direct control over the land route between the city of Alexandria and the city of Damascus. Uh, they've already sufficiently undercut the, the uh, incense uh, the incense route. Uh, with their uh, shipbuilding projects in the Red Sea, that they no longer feel that that is the main priority. The main priority is trade between Damascus and Alexandria, both of which Rome controls. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately for the Nabataeans, they're unable to offer any reasonable resistance to the Roman takeover. They've been so weakened over the past century of vassalship that direct roman rule is seen as little more than changing the name of who's king oh yeah it's it's just it's just seen of like we're taking one step of the bureaucracy out whoop de doo right <laughs> they do lose some of their uh prestige with the romans shifting the capital from petra to basra but really again they can't do much about it um, and one of the things that the Romans do that makes the Nabataeans really go along with this is the Romans pour money into Nabataea. Like the oh, Romans, for like development then. Yeah, the Romans fund the shit out of this because keep in mind, they want Nabataea for control of trade routes. And being Romans, that means they just rebuild every single road in Nabataea to Roman standards. So there's just massive construction works that go into uh, the takeover. 
Um, they also completely rebuild parts of major cities. Uh, the biggest example of this is Decapolis, where the Romans effectively rebuild almost the entire thing. I think two-thirds of the city gets torn down and rebuilt in stone. Which is... Uh, uh, yeah, no, that's an extensive massive. construction project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they experience a lot of renewed growth and attention uh, during the 3rd century crisis, uh, which is a period from 235 to 285 CE, in which the Romans have more emperors than they have years. Oh, yeah. Um, and ironically, Nabatea makes out like a bandit during this crisis, because they're the border, they're the, you know, border province on the fringe of the empire, and, um, they make some very useful friends. Um, the first of these friends is Philip the Arab, who rules from 244 to 249. Uh, now, Philip the Arab gets his name for being from this area. So, one of the things that happens during the five years he's on the throne is in order to get in good with him, the Parthians start trading with <laughs> with these bordering provinces like uh, like Arabia, like Roman Arabia. And so there's this massive trade boom because the Parthians want to get in good with this new with this new emperor, especially since Philip the Arab is one of the few emperors during this time that looks like he might actually uh, restore Rome. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. He dies and the chaos continues but he's one of the like first people to really sandbag the absolute anarchy that is gripping the uh the nation about 10 years into the crisis um then towards the back end of the crisis we get aurelian restorer of rome who rules from 270 to 275 and he during his time recognizes that the key to stability is giving everyone something to do because people have been sitting idle for 40 years by the time he comes into the 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 picture and when people are idle they have time to join armies against you yeah, but if you give them, yeah but if you give everyone a job suddenly you're seen as working towards things and they have something to do other than build a sword gee so he establishes the Limes Arabicus, which is a series of Roman border forts on the frontier of the Arabian Desert. Uh, basically yes, saying, the Limes system. Yeah, basically saying, if you're going to militarize, militarize that way. <laughs> yeah. As in, away from me. <laughs> they went, they're going the route that they did in uh, along yeah. Germany, or what would be yeah. Germany. Yeah, it's it's the route along the German. They do this in the German border. They do this in the Dacian border. They start to do this in the Scottish border, and then decide, no, we're building an actual wall. <laughs> They're just kind of like, man, these pecs are wild, literally. Yeah, yep. let's just build a wall. Yeah, he also helps ensure the protection of uh, Arabia and the Limes Arabicus by uh, adding a second legion to the province which is a uh, which is a big deal um because most most provinces have one legion some have two britain has four so getting the second legion means that you are important enough to defend to really defend like you're not you're not considered a cushy little side project you're 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 in the big leagues now yeah and then and then finally we get diocletian who is the last time the Romans really pay attention to this place as the Romans. Diocletian ends the 3rd century crisis. He takes the throne in 284. He rules till 309. He reorganizes the Limes Arabicus that was put in place by Aurelian. He refines everything. And he builds the Quasar Bashir, which is the most impressive and famous fort on the Limes Arabicus. It is huge. It is a massive stone fortress in the middle of the desert. And if you were just looking at it, you would be thinking, who the hell built this out here? Like, it's, lit it's literally just surrounded by sand for miles on end. 
there's no the nothing to around cut it. all the way out here and it's just a massive fort and it's a, it's a very um it's a very impressive fort and it's a very famous fort and uh the fact that you know he's putting Diocletian is putting in all this time and money into Arabia speaks to the ease at which it is governed and the prosperity at which it is with which it is providing Rome and that's that's the big deal. That's kind of the last time we really see the Nabataeans as the Nabataeans. At this point, they're Romanized. And when the Roman Empire collapses in about a hundred years, uh, into you know, with the Tetrarchy and the West, you know, completely falling into chaos, mm-hmm. the Nabataeans find themselves independent. They find themselves a very different and changed people who go back to doing the exact same thing they've always done. Hide in the deserts, demand demand payment for passage. I I would argue that uh, they wouldn't have been too Romanized that if they just went right back to what they were doing. If you think about it, maybe the cities oh, no. have they're, a very they're... like Romanesque feel, but like maybe culturally, probably not. Yeah. Oh, they become very Romanized in the sense that like they are now extremely militant when they are dealing with the Byzantines. Oh, that they, kind. Of, okay, that kind of Romanized, like not so much we speak Latin and wear togas, so much more in the sense of like half of our population is the army. Who would like okay, to die yeah. first? <laughs> yeah, I get you now. I was like, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good distinction to make because it's not, it, it, it's, it's not Romanized in the sense of adopting Roman culture. It's Romanized in the sense of. We just became the military. It's just we're militants. An extreme aggressive. But yeah, that is uh, that is the history of the Nabataeans. And you know, we kind of see that dichotomy a little bit and just how much more there is that isn't talked about, and just how much how many gaps there are in in what we do have. This is this is this is something that's ripe for the plucking for historians, for archaeologists, for anyone really, just to try and get you know the information out there to study this because they are a fascinating people. They are the foundation of the Arabic uh, languages, uh, specifically the writing system. They are this wily trade empire that just outlives enemy after enemy after enemy, and no one talks about them and when they do they're a footnote in somebody else's war that's that's just that's just a shame well cool i think that's a good point for us to wrap up today's episode thank you guys for listening if you enjoyed let us know down below and we'll see you guys in the next one peace